What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Expert Trader podcast series. We're doing something a little different this week. We're going to go through and analyze one of our articles that we've written instead of doing uh, an interview with somebody, because I feel like there's a lot of things that are changing in the fundamentals world and it'd be best to get that news out to you guys and get that information to you uh, on the weekend. So the recent article that was just written is called The Pandemic Aftermath, What's Coming? And it's supposed to explore sort of the market reactions that are supposed to, that we can expect um, as we end as we end this current phase of the economic cycle and as we head into the recovery phase of the economic cycle, which as you guys have heard could last a year, maybe a year and a half. So let's go through some of the, let's go through some of the key things that are happening right now. And then if you guys have any questions, make sure to comment below on this video and we'll make sure to answer those for you. If anything is not clear in this explanation, let's go ahead and get started. So the introduction says, is the economy better than it's ever been, as the president claims, or are we in a deep recessionary cycle caused by the Federal Reserve interference and reliance on cheap credit? So that's a mouthful when you first read it. And a lot of people are like, whoa, okay, what, what does it even mean? Uh, the president of the United States, in order, to re, in order to win the next election, he needs to keep the economy, he needs to keep the sentiment about the economy positive. And so he'll get out in front of everybody and say the economy is doing the best it's ever been. Unemployment is you know, the best it's ever been, the best it's ever been. But then we go back and we look at the actual data and we see, are we in a recessionary cycle or are we not? And the answer is yes. We've seen the S&P 500 down almost 50% for the past several months. And then we see that unemployment is at all time highs. We see manufacturing is at a dead stop. And then we see that global trade is slowing down. With all these factors combined together, it does not lead to a healthy economy. So just by making that inference, I was saying there is, um, there's a deep recessionary cycle caused by Federal Reserve interference. This means like the Federal Reserve keeps printing money and that's the real problem. It's not that we keep going into a recession, it's our response to the recession that keeps making the next one worse. Uh, the reliance on cheap credit, that's like free money that they keep printing. So we'll go back and retouch on this in a little bit. So let's go ahead and get through this reminder. As the elections get closer, we can expect to see arguments from both sides about the health of the economy. Now I know that we are market participants, but politics directly influence the fundamentals. Fundamentals influence the sentiment in the market. Sentiment influences the actions of the participants and the actions of the participants leads to the action in the markets, leads to the movement in the market. So long story short, let's just start at the very beginning instead of just looking at the price action. And let's look at what we can tell based on what they're about to start, uh, based on the narrative that they're about to start implementing. So Republicans are gonna to try to start, are going to try to blame the state of the economy on the virus and the Democrats will blame it on poor policy response from the White House. So the Republicans are going to say things were going great. We had an all time high economy. Nobody expected the plague to come and they're going to keep calling it the plague and making it sound worse than it actually is because they want to make it seem like it's a black swan event that we couldn't have prepared for. If we can be completely honest, the person who wrote the black swan, Nassim Talib, he said that it's not a black swan event. It's a white swan. White swans means that they, they're actually predictable because do viruses exist? They do. And are viruses likely to infect people? They are. And so just by that logical premise, we can expect that viruses will eventually come out and attack or will eventually come out and infect the population. So this is something that the government should have expected. But long story short, we'll go to the other side of the argument, which is poor policy response from the White House. Democrats will say that the White House didn't move fast enough for coronavirus. They exacerbated this and that. They, they waited too long. They cut the budget for uh, the CDC and the NIH. And that's just going to be the fight that's going to happen. Uh, Democrats will say the stimulus is the main is the the stimulus to Main Street is what saved the economy, which is wrong. Regardless of what either side says, just remember that we're still going to be in a recession during the election season. This is just important because when you guys turn on the news, you're going to be lied to a lot. So this is just important to keep yourself grounded and to realize like, hey, listen, if you just look at the numbers, we're in a recession. All the talking heads on TV are trying to keep the sentiment high because that's how you get reelected. So just let them talk. Make sure that you guys stay, stick to your guns and use your rationale. Our argument is that the economy is headed for a collapse with or without the virus. The underlying fundamentals were inherently negative and were due to burst. The stimulus added by the government has not only pushed off this crisis, but will also create the largest bubble in economic history. We will explore these reasons in further detail. The second wave of the virus will play a substantial role in the health of the economy. There's a lot here. Let's start with this second wave of the virus. You guys have seen there's been multitudes of protests. And so these people are going to congregate together, mask or no mask. They're still touching, hugging, being close next to one another. Then they're going back home and infecting the people that they live with. So the second wave of the virus is going to be caused by, you know, that exacerbation of just early opening and some of the states that opened early. And then it's going to be a, 
perhaps a, a second shutdown. Now, I know the government is very hesitant on doing a second shutdown because they saw the ramifications of the first one. But if the second wave is going to kill more people, are they going to shut down the economy again? If they do, we're in for, we're in for a big crash in the stock market. So let's go through like the main point of this article. And I won't do any, I won't do any explanations on this. I'm just going to read this through. The most important aspect of the economic crash is the policy response from regulators and governments. The current U.S. administration, they ran on the premise of reducing the government budget, on lowering taxes, and on reducing the, infl the inflationary role of the Federal Reserve. What we now see is the largest stimulus plan that has ever been implemented. The PPE and the CARES Act programs will cost a total of $2 trillion to the U.S. taxpayer. Now, of course, it won't be financed by the taxpayer today. Instead, they're going to leverage the help of the Federal Reserve for quick cash and then put the cost of future generations to deal with. Along with fiscal stimulus to the Fed, uh, along with the fiscal stimulus, which is money to, to Main Street and to small businesses and to the pockets of the individual consumer, the Federal Reserve has pledged a trillion dollars to help maintain the credit markets, which is known as monetary stimulus, further adding to the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, which means the Federal Reserve, a private entity that's supposed to help our nation in uh, mitigating the boom and bust cycles that we go through, or the, the recessionary and inflationary cycles that we go through, their balance sheet is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which means that they are buying up U.S. treasuries, owning more of U.S. assets. Okay. So key terms to keep in mind, what is stimulus? I know I've said a lot of these words already. Let's go through these real quick. Stimulus is a thing or action that promotes activity or energy in someone or something, a spur or incentive. So stimulus in this case is free money out to the markets to get them to be active and to get them to promote activity, you know, through lending and through business activity. What is credit? Credit is just debt. The ability for an, for an entity to obtain goods or services before payment based on the trust that payment is going to be made in the future. Okay, it's like an IOU. Credit is huge and it's the way that our economy currently works. People are not, you know, corporations don't just have a, a ton of cash just sitting around. What they do is they can use the cash that they have sitting around to leverage credit from people who have more cash sitting around and they use that in order to make things move. That's how the wealthy are able to uh, maintain uh, maintain like grabbing more assets over and over again. It's not because they have more cash sitting on the sideline. It's because they can leverage it. What is the CARES Act? The CARES Act is a bill that was passed as a, as a part of the coronavirus relief fund, which provides immediate financial assistance to those who need it. So for people who are unemployed, people or businesses that can't stay open, any type of relief that they need, the CARES Act take care of that, takes care of that. The Federal Reserve balance sheet. Okay, like any business, they have a balance sheet and it maintains their assets and liabilities. During economic crises, the Federal Reserve can expand its balance sheet by buying more assets. And then what is a bubble? All right, it occurs when the price of an asset, such as stocks, bonds, real estate, or commodities, rises at a rapid pace without any of the underlying fundamentals, such as equally fast rising demand, to justify the price spike. So pretty much prices are going up for no reason. Eventually, they'll come back down. That's what a bubble is. So you think about like, what are the most recent bubbles that we remember? Well, first in 1999, 2001, we had the dot-com bubble. Everyone rushed into investing in um, into internet companies. And because of that, they inflated the price of companies that really didn't deserve to have their prices that high because they weren't that effective and they weren't that useful. And what ended up happening is once the smoke settled, they realized that only two of the companies that they were investing in were good and the rest were trash. They pulled their money out, the entire asset bubble crashed, and then uh, we had the dot-com bubble. Now, the second one is the mortgage bubble of 2008. Everybody was, was uh, leveraging and buying mortgage-backed securities. Every bank was selling mortgage-backed securities. What ended up happening is that people were buying mortgage-backed securities that were tied to very shitty mortgages, and then it ended up just crashing that bubble. Now we're in an, a second asset bubble, which could be either the real estate bubble, a student loan bubble. Uh, you know, There's a lot that's going on in this country that we're going to have to take a look at. History and policy response. This is just a quick overview of like the history of markets. Ever since the, the first markets have been around, there's been bubbles. Okay, so the first market that was, uh, the first bubble that was actually noted was the tulip mania. And so a lot of people started speculating on the price of tulips as they were being grown. And as that speculation, you know, got out of hand, all the working people wanted to get involved. What happened is they pumped the bubble. The rich people walked away from the bubble. The bubble burst because there was no demand for tulips uh, after a certain point. And then that was the creation of the first bubble. So they are normal. They're not caused by the Federal Reserve. But today, the, exacerb the exacerbation of the current bubble is caused by the Federal Reserve, which is why it's different than the ones in the past. The past 30, 40, 50 years, the policy response from the Federal Reserve has been, let's print more money. 
by printing more money, it's always just added more cash to the system that doesn't necessarily belong there. And it's added problems because that cash found its way into the wrong places. That's pretty much what this says here. Um, the premise behind this is that if bubbles are going to happen, okay, so this is pretty much explaining why they give out free cash. So the premise behind it is if bubbles are going to happen regardless, then it would be better for the federal reserve to control them and make them more predictable. They believe if the government can flood the markets with cash, then borrowers can go out and lend to other borrowers and stimulate the economy. Now let's look at reality because this is all fun and games and theory and all that. So the reality is that corporations and banks have always taken the money and bought back their own stock to increase their share of the company. What this has led to is a perfect correlation between Federal Reserve action and stock market recovery. Now let's put that in today's terms. The economy is going to shit, but the stock market is, is rising. How is this possible? So we just go back and we look at this and we realize that the Federal Reserve has been printing money. And because the Federal Reserve has been printing money, it's going to find its way back into the, into the stock markets and the stock markets will recover as usual just because of that simple fact. As long as they print funny money, it's going to end up in the markets. What this leads us to conclude is that the current rise in U.S. indices is not due to optimism about the future and is certainly not representative of economic health. Instead, it is a representative of the Federal Reserve printing money and that same credit getting locked into the equity markets. This means that the stock market has now become a better gauge of the wealth of the rich as opposed to the wealth of the Main Street investor. So the stock market is now sort of exasperating the wealth gap because the people who own the majority of the stocks are individuals who, who own these corporations. And as the stock prices increase, their net worth increases by the billions. Like you and I, if we own, if we own $10,000 of a stock, we might increase our net worth by several thousand dollars, and that would be a considerable percentage. But if we had a billion dollars to play with, then that subsequent uh, return will be around four or $500 million, and that actually matters. And so that's why pumping up the stock market matters for these folks. So what comes next? This is the part that you've all been waiting for, all right? The euphoria in the markets is at an all-time high. The credit-dependent companies, okay, they're like drug addicts. They're, they're reliant on this cheap credit. And banks have responded predictably to the monetary stimulus. The stock bubble is only getting exacerbated by the recycling of government credit. Government prints it. It ends up in the hands of banks. Banks give it to corporations and their other friends and their other member banks. And they all buy back stock and they all buy back um, shares. They all buy back mortgages. They do whatever they can to bring the assets back into their balance sheet so they can control what goes up and what's, what goes down. Okay, lending is not very popular in times where the economy is crashing because of a virus. At the same time, small businesses are getting hit because of uh, protests. So nobody's going to be lending out credit the way that they were before the pandemic, which means that banks are not going to be loaning out business loans, which means what are they going to do with all this free cash? They're going to lock it back into the equity markets. The stock market bubble is only getting exasperated by the recycling of government credit. Could this mean that the stock market could collapse if in the US if the government stops printing money? Could this mean that the breakout traders are going to get burned by the economic reality of the situation? Or will the high of having cheap credit cure the withdrawal long enough to make the economy recover? This is the most important thing I probably said in this entire, uh, in this entire article. These are very important questions. If the printing stops, will the stock market crash? This is a real question. Could breakout traders that are trying to, that are trying to trade the upside of the stock market, are they going to get burned by the fact that we're actually in a recession? These are questions that we all need to ask. It's easiest to compare the economy to a sick person. So this is, the port, this is the part where we bring it all back home and we let you guys understand this so you can explain it to the next person. The easiest way to compare the current economy is to a sick individual. Instead of the sick person changing their, the sick person changing their diet, doing rehab and taking the long road, which is very long, grueling. You got to go back to the doctors. You got to make sure you're eating right. You can't eat certain things that make you feel better while you're sick. Instead, that same sick person just wants the opiates. Okay, the opiates, for those of you guys who don't know, these are pain medications, the strongest that you can find. And they give them to people who have been in car accidents, that have surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. For people who don't need opiates, these are a cop-out. These are lazy. What they do is, is instead of actually going to do the work of actually recovering from that injury, what you're doing is you're going to take a short-term uh, short exit and you're just going to get the pain out of the way as soon as possible. Printing money is our version of taking the, the painkillers. Uh, changing our diet, doing rehab, and taking the long road is letting these companies and these sick companies crash. Understanding that we're going to be in a little bit of a tough squeeze for a while. There's going to be a lot of unemployed people. But understanding that out of this is going to come very useful companies that are going to drive our, com our country to the future. Instead, what people want to see is, let's just get out of this as soon as possible, especially if it's an election year. So 
can we keep pumping opium into the markets until, it's, uh, until it looks good enough for the people to forget about it? The answer is yes. So 2008 was the result of stimulus that the government printed in response to the dot-com bubble. We took pain meds in 01 to avoid doing the hard work. The system crashed from the center in 08, which is Wall Street. The center, I mean the center of the global economic system. Because usually when there's, a, when, there's a global, when there's a global response, it's usually from a several different places. They all have debt defaults and they can't pay off their debts. That denomination of debt is usually in dollars. And because they default on the dollar denominated debt, they end up going in debt to the United States. This time it's the exact opposite. This time from the center and the heart of the economic uh, machine, Wall Street crashed and it caused a whiplash around the rest of the world. Now, how did Wall Street have so much cash to make the rest of the world crash? So what happened was in 01, they printed a bunch of funny money. They let it slosh in the system. Because of all this fake money, these guys started inventing new ways and new instruments, new financial instruments, such as oh, mortgage-backed securities and other securities that they had. And because of these mortgage-backed securities and because of these things that they used, because of the credit instruments that they used, because of the fact that they had extra money, it ended up getting sloshed around the system. They were giving it to people who were not credit worthy. They were just lending it to anybody who had a pulse. And that ended up crashing the system. Um, so the system crashed in 08. And instead of letting the body he uh, finally heal itself, we pumped it with even more pain meds. So Obama, he took over the office in 2008, 2009 during the recession. And it was one of the worst economic crises that we've ever had. And the only rational policy response from the Fed, which is Ben Bernanke at the time, uh, he said that we should just start quantitative easing, which is flooding the market with cash, flooding the market with cash, flooding the market with cash. And then we're going to buy securities. And then they're like, oh, this is only temporary. We're not going to do this for long. Long story short, they did it for a long time. In 2015, 2016, they tried to pull it back. They're like, okay, guys, no more free money. Let's start to raise the interest rates a little bit. The markets hammered them for it. All the equity markets and the oil markets and everything crashed. And so they're like, oh, whoa, whoa. Maybe we can never go back to normal. Maybe we have shot ourselves in the foot. And every time we try to go back to normal, markets are going to burn us. And that's kind of the cycle that we're in right now. So now it's uh, 2019, 2020, we're having withdrawals from the cheap credit that we had in 2008, 20, right? and 20, 2009. And of course, the second wave of coronavirus may bring the markets back to reality by exposing how deep the recession really is. This, is. this is like the most curious part of all this. We are really in one of the most unprecedented times. And I know that there's economists that'll compare this to 99, a little bit to 39, a little bit to 87, a little bit to 82. This is like everything that we've ever seen combined and unlike everything that we've ever seen. The coronavirus has put a dead stop into the economy, which we've never seen before. Is the second wave of the coronavirus going to bring on this shock that leads us into a depression? So that's what we have to see. And last but not least, guys, what you've all been waiting for, the conclusions and the FX predictions, what's going to happen with the markets? Like, okay, Roy, I understand the politics, but I'm not a politician. How do I trade this stuff? As a result of the overinflated asset prices, we can expect to see some of the air come out of the stock bubble. So the S&P 500 prices should see a decline back to normalcy so as to reflect the health of the equity markets. So if right now, all of the companies that are being pumped up, so you look at a lot of the stock, the S&P 500 companies, if they're being pumped up, but there's no action in the economy, if roofers and, and people who work in cement and people who work inside of housing, if they can't go out there and build houses. They don't need to go to Lowe's and, and uh, Home Depot to buy stuff. So why is Lowe's and Home Depot's prices getting pumped up? If nobody's buying houses, why are the housing markets going, going up? If nobody's buying um, old stocks like IBM and Cisco, excuse me, why would their stocks go up? So long story short, I feel like some of the older stocks in the stock market are going to start to fall off. Some of the newer stocks, cloud computing and all this, this is not financial advice. I'm just saying, you know, out of logical sense, cloud computing, cryptocurrency, uh, blockchain devices, uh, biomedical, nanotechnology, anything that's about the future, that's about an innovative technology that's going to bring human life further or human consciousness or human productivity further, that stuff is worth investing in. But is that enough to bring the stock market higher? Long story short, S&P crash if we can't uh, hold up the economy. Due to the unlimited printing of free dollars, we can expect to see a crash in the value of the United States dollar and a rapid rise in the price of gold. These are just counter correlates. If the, if the dollar crashes, the price of gold should go up because it is a safe haven. All right? Even though it's not being treated like one, it is a storehouse of wealth. A lot of central banks and central banks are probably the only people that actually hold reserve gold. And so they need to keep the price of gold high 
or sorry, they don't need to keep the price of gold high, but the price of gold will naturally be higher if the price of the US dollar is lower. Since gold is valued in terms of dollar, the lower the price of the dollar, the higher the price of gold should be. So there's two scenarios here, and I'll go ahead and turn this back on for you. all There's two scenarios that we can see here. Either the dollar crashes because they're printing too much, too much of it, and they're making it cheap, or the dollar rises as it's been doing, because the more they print, the more the rest of the world realizes they need dollars in their bank. They don't care where it comes from. They could print it. They can come off whatever could fall from the sky. Free dollars is free dollars. So maybe developing nations are going to start to trap that free dollars and keep creating that, that uh, demand for it, which means that as they print money, everybody else goes like hungry, hungry hippo, and they go and try to get their share of the pie and the value of the dollar is going to go up because it's going to become more scarce. If the second wave of the coronavirus hits, they're going to have to do another wave of, of the PPE and the CARES Act. Are they going to do another 700 billion or a trillion dollars? Now you and I have to ask ourselves, is an extra trillion dollars in the economy just getting slushed around? Is that going to cause another 2008? Is it going to cause another 1999, 2001? My answer is hell yes. There's, there is no conceivable way in my mind that we can print this much money into the economy and not have what happened last time. That's just common sense. If you guys are watching this, just keep in mind that the media is going to try to fool you. The economy is not better than it's ever been. And just keep looking at things like the manufacturing numbers. Are manufacturers building stuff? If manufacturers are building, that means the economy is, that means that they see the economy recovering. That's a good sign. Consumers. Consumers are not the best gauge of the economy because right now they have free money. Of course, they're outspending. I have friends that are making more money off unemployment than they were at a part-time job. And so the understanding that the economy is recovering is, is not true. The second that the faucet stops and they stop printing the money, the economy is going to go right to where it's supposed to be, which is at zero. So we should save the extra money instead of giving it out right now, trying to make it look good so Trump can get elected. We should save it, bite the bullet, you know, clean the wound, throw alcohol on it, you know, eat it up, eat, you know, suck it up in, in terms. And at the very end, right when the economy is about to recover, let's start pumping this, this uh, liquidity right back into the markets so that we can have a healthy recovery. Not a fake recovery, but a healthy recovery. Because if you can recover without the money and then we add the money to help, then that's how true recovery can actually happen. So guys, this is not financial advice. This is just my perspective on the markets. If you found this interesting, please let me know in the comments. If you disagree, I definitely want to know because I'm always open to new ideas, even though I'm very confident about this prediction. Guys, happy and safe trading this week. Take it easy. If you have any questions, you guys know where to find us. Char addicts at Instagram and char addicts at gmail.com. Take it easy. Happy and safe trading. Peace. And if you guys want to catch this article, it's on the Chart Addicts website, chartaddictsfx.com post-pandemic aftermath, what's coming. All right, take it easy, y'all.